Okay. Steve, can you hear? You're automatically muted. Can you hear us? Okay. Now I, sorry. There it is. <laughs> and my video is off too. My goodness. I'm just. Um... <laughs> He looks like digitally rendered. <laughs> now my camera's, my usual camera isn't working, so I guess the I'm fake going background to makes the foreground camera. look fake. <laughs> All right, so I don't know what happened. I I had it in my calendar for noon, so I apologize to everybody for holding everyone up. Um, but yes, so we are here for Michael Pilosov's PhD defense. And, and so I'm not seeing, uh, okay, I, I'm just wanna make sure, I, I'm assuming that everybody on the committee, yeah, Jimmy's here, okay, great. So, um, so welcome everybody and especially welcome me being late. Um, let's go ahead and get started then. Well, I'll just turn it over to Mark. Are we good? Steve? Yeah, we're, yeah, go ahead, Michael. Perfect. All right. Well, starting, the recording's been started, just so everyone's aware. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Michael Pilosov. I'm here to uh, defend my dissertation. Uh, it's title slides, Computational Advancements in Measured Theoretic Methods, in Data Consistent Inversion, Measured Theoretic Methods for Improving Predictions. Now, uh, I'm going to give you a quick outline of how this talk is going to go. We're going to start off with some backgrounds on uh, inverse problems, both the kind that we solve and the kind that uh, Bayesian community solves, and just demonstrate some of the differences between these two. Namely, we're going to talk about the difference between aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. This is irreducible and reducible uncertainty. Epistemic uncertainty is reducible. As you collect more data, it should be less, uh, less uncertainty. Aleatoric is just fundamentally, there's some variability that's irreducible and it's never gonna be gotten rid of. Now, motivation for this talk is then that we wanted to be able to solve epistemic problems in a framework meant to solve aleatoric problems. And we demonstrate how to do this by incorporating arbitrary streams of data. See, like I went to LANL, uh, Los Alamos National Lab in 2017, and the researchers I was working with there had a type of problem that I just wasn't able to handle. Like the framework that I had been working on with Troy just wasn't meant to address this epistemic uncertainty quantification problem. It was an aleatoric framework. So the next couple of years were basically just motivated by how do I generate this problem in the right way so that it's answering their question. And so that's going to be the central contribution here is how to define a quantity of interest map that basically solves an epistemic uncertainty quantification problem in an aleatoric framework. So in order to do that, we're basically going to show you how to do parameter identification in a data consistent inversion framework. Uh, I'm going to show you some theory about how this works out in linear and Gaussian cases, the derivations that are novel to this work before moving on to some computational examples and a brief touch on the extensions of the work. So why do we do this? Why is any of this uh, you know, a subject in the first place. Well, uncertainty quantification is super, super important when you have just data and you want to know what happened that led you to observe the data that you, uh, that you collected. Now, the data you collected is probably quite noisy. There's measurement error, maybe imprecise, imprecision of where you've placed your measurement equipment. There's all this uncertainty involved and you want to know how that propagates to the sorts of predictions and conclusions you can make. So we want to use this to make more accurate and precise uh, conclusions and define efficient experiments that give us more precise information. Uh, that's sort of a topic called optimal experimental design. We won't really touch on it, but uh, we have little bits of extensions for it. So let's quickly go through the notation. Uh, here is a slide with more or less everything that we're going to need for the rest of the talk. Uh, namely, we have parameters that are lambda. These are inputs to a model. That model uh, outputs a state variable. This can be some sort of differential equation, and you're measuring heat, energy, whatever. And then off this surface, this response surface, you then grab measurements. Now, simulating that getting of measurements, like where you put the sensors and the collection of data is represented abstractly as this quantity of interest map. You might have it to be vector valued, which means you have many different components. 
um, but each one is basically a mapping from the response surface to a real number. It's a functional. So it has a dependence on the state variable u. But that's going to get no, uh, nasty with notation, all those parentheses. So we're just going to write q of lambda uh, to make this dependence on the parameter explicit. And I'm going to hide the effect of the model. So pictorially speaking, here's what we're doing. <laughs> on the left, you have your parameter space lambda. This is your set of inputs to your model. Uh, going on the arrow on the bottom, we're moving through a model of some sort. This can be a differential equation. This can be a neural network, some black box. And the outputs of that are used to uh, make some sort of measurement. So this could be your error against your training examples. This could be your measurements from the response surface. That's what Q of U of lambda represents, that top arrow, which defines the data space D. So mapping of the parameter space forward under Q is represented uh, by that top arrow, sort of just abstractly hiding that black box effect in the bottom. And that's just what's going to define our data space. So let's give some more formalism. That's not me, right? That's me, sorry. So let's get some more formalism to this slide, uh, to this diagram. So that forward problem, propagation of uncertainty, is called a stochastic forward problem. Given a probability measure on the parameter space, mapping it forward in the way given by 2.1 will define a measure on the output space, on the output space D. D. Going the other way, specifying a measure on the output space and then looking for a corresponding measure that agrees with it on the input space is called the stochastic inverse problem. Equation 2.3 is what we're going to refer to as the consistency condition. Satisfying the consistency condition is the motivation of the stochastic inverse problem. This is the aleatoric uncertainty quantification problem and framework that we deal with. This is the universe that we live in. So if you have, can we mute? I am, I'm sorry. Steve, can you just please mute your... Sorry. I am trying. My I cannot get my... Sorry. You may need to turn it off. There he is. Um, Mute his my iPhone. iPhone sometimes interferes with the computer in weird ways as well. It's so funny. All right, there we go. So um, the bottom equation, 2.3, is this uh, stochastic inverse problem. This is the aleatoric uncertainty quantification framework that we that Troy developed uh, for his dissertation and work afterwards. Uh, and this is the universe that I was trained in. Now, in the presence of a dominating measure on either of these spaces, you can actually define the densities associated with these measures through the radon Nicodem derivatives. Now, throughout this presentation, we're mostly going to be focusing on these densities. And uh, those densities allow us to basically expand the equations that we just had in the previous slides, as you see on the bottom here. We can write it with, as an integration with respect to some set on the respective spaces. Um, and we have a density that's telling us like how mass accumulates throughout that space. Um, now let's talk about not so abstractly, let's talk about the specific roles played by the measures in those previous two definitions. Now, when the measure on the input space is quantifying the uncertainty in your parameters, that's going to be referred to as an initial measure. You haven't taken any data into account. You haven't done any observations. This is just your initial beliefs about the system. Take note. Your initial beliefs are known as the initial distribution. When you when you have that dominating measure, then you could write it as a density, right? So when we push forward this initial measure, we get a predicted distribution and a predicted measure. And so that's defined by equation 2.4. It's, it's the sort of corresponding um, forward problem that we just solved. We have an observation, so we have a measure that quantifies uncertainty in the output space. So now we're going to have a different thing playing the role of uh, the measure on the data space. When it's characterizing the uncertainty in the quantity of interests data, then it's called an observed measure and we get an observed distribution. These three components are what we need to define the solution to the stochastic inverse problem. Solution to stochastic inverse problem is known as an updated distribution, or again, an updated measure. It is defined as a pullback measure of the observed with respect to the predicted. The density form of the equation, when we have those integrals involved, can be written as equation 2.5. It is a weighting of your initial beliefs by the ratio of likelihood between your observed and predicted densities. Now, those two components are both functions, right? They're, they're not 
the same everywhere necessarily unless you define the measures that way. So practical considerations. The updated density, in order to evaluate it, you can go, you can evaluate it anywhere in the primary space for the cost of a single model solve. Uh, the solution to the stochastic inverse problem is stable with respect to perturbations and the total variation metric, and its accuracy is proportional to that denominator term's accuracy. So if you do well on predicting the, uh, the predicted, you're going to do good uh, predicting the, uh, as getting, recovering the update, updated. Now, how do, you, uh, per, how do you approximate that predicted density, that denominator term? Well, we approximate it using Gaussian kernel density estimation. This is an approach, one, we can use for density estimation. It's not the only one, but it's what we're going to use throughout this talk. It has well understood convergence and dimensional dependence rates, and those are listed at the bottom of this slide. Do note that there's this dimensional dependence, so that it's uh, the number of samples required is going to have uh, is going to grow quite large as you scale from like one to to five, ten dimensions, uh, let alone to hundreds of thousands. You're basically out of the realm of possibilities for the large sample sizes you need to do accurate approximations. So we're going to come back to that at the very, very end with some extensions. Um, mostly, we're going to be posing problems where the samples we use are more than sufficient to resolve the predicted density. So. Let's compare this solution to a stochastic inverse problem to something else in the uh, inverse problem literature. The most common set of approaches, which is called uh, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian inverse problems or deterministic inverse problems, they're defined by uh, this problem of modeling the epistemic uncertainty in the data. You want to have this property that as you collect more and more uh, data, you have less and less uncertainty because your assumption is that one true parameter generated all of the data, that all of the variability was due to measurement noise, not due to natural variability in the parameters, which is that aleatoric problem. So again, they're solving a different problem. Their forward problem then is corresponding different. They just map a point forward, and their inverse problem is to minimize the mismatch between the quantity of interest and the data, where the data is a perturbation of uh, that's an unobservable perturbation to the uh, quantity to the data uh, to the quantity of interest uh, that's just generated by the true parameter. So this C letter uh, represents epistemic uncertainty. This is a modeling of your measurement error. You want to see that as you have more and more of them, more and more realizations, uh, your uncertainty goes down. So their solution is given as a posterior. It's conditional density. It's an, uh, it's you're updating your initial beliefs by incorporating data. It's the, uh, the philosophical implication of what they're trying to do. We are trying to pull back a distribution. They are trying to update their initial beliefs, their prior beliefs with data. Prior is going to play that same sort of role as our initial density, and posterior is going to be proportional to it, just like we had. But now they don't have a ratio of two functions. They have a ratio of a likelihood function, which is not necessarily a density, and a constant. And that constant on the denominator ensures that we have integration to unity. So the posterior is actually a density. So this evidence term is constant. Everywhere in the output space, it has the same evaluation. Uh, now we're going to pose a problem where we're going to force the two uh, approaches, the deterministic inverse problem and the stochastic inverse problem, to solve the same problem. We're going to match up all the components of the problem so that they are, uh, to provide an illustrative example, that they are doing different things. You can have this nonlinear monomial map, lambda to the fifth, over the parameter space negative one to one. Same data space, because that's where it gets mapped to. So we're going to impose a uniform initial density, but due to the nonlinear of the map, the push forward, the predicted density is going to have this discontinuity at zero. It's going to have a peak. Um, the observed distribution we're going to specify is normal centered at a quarter with uh, standard deviation uh, point one. Corresponding to that, we're going to pose the deterministic inverse problem as uh, being perturbed by measurement noise with the same variance, but again, all generated from this true parameter. Uh, the prior and initial are chosen to be the same, and the center of the likelihood is chosen so that the densities then match the observeds. So now we've forced these two things to do the same thing, these two approaches to solve the same problem, and we're going to notice the differences between the solutions. On the top, we have the parameter space, and on the bottom, we have the data space. So the initial density and prior are the same thing, so it's going to be given by this blue line, and pushing that forward is going to be given by the corresponding blue line on the bottom. Likewise, the updated solution and the posterior on the top are then pushed forward 
uh, to give you the corresponding lines with the same color on the bottom. Notice that the updated, or draw your attention to the bottom plot, notice how the black and curve sits directly on top of the red curve. The push forward of the update matches the observed, this normal distribution, because it's by design. That is the solution to stochastic inverse problem. We are pulling back the observed distribution. The Bayesian push forward of the posterior, not something that they're actually interested in computing, but if you compute it, we notice that it is actually given a sort of a weighted average between the likelihood function, this normal, and the push forward of the initial. It's taking some influence from this high density at zero and shifting probability away because your initial beliefs have concentrated high likelihood around that, uh, that estimate, right? You're putting some bias around that explaining your data. So what happens as more data becomes available? Well, now the two approaches really start to differ and they're really not going to do uh, the same thing at all. Uh, and we have to form the problems in slightly different ways. So the stochastic inverse problem doesn't really have, at this point, we're going to get to one, a way to incorporate an arbitrary number of data points, except perhaps to just use the mean of the data that you collected to estimate the observed distributions of mean. Uh, the likelihood function from the deterministic inverse problem, however, incorporates each of these measurements and gets more and more peaked. You get more confidence from likelihood function. So they're going to converge to a Dirac delta as you take more delta, uh, information more data. Making this more uh, visually evident, we have five data points, 10, 20. The likelihood function is getting more peaked. And as a result, the update, the posterior is getting more peaked. Uh, it's non-Gaussian because of the non-linear of the map. It has this skew to the side a little bit. But notice in all of these diagrams, the observed distribution and the push forward the update stay the same because we are still solving the same problem. Uh, this is where, again, the differences really become clear. As you take more data for the Bayesian approach, your initial beliefs no longer uh, dominate your predictions, right? They become more and more like the likelihood function. On our end, we will keep matching the uncertainty in the observed measure, observed data. Now, I wanna use this stuff for parameter estimation. That's what this talks about. How do we do parameter identification in a framework that's not actually reduced, like as more measurements are being collected, it's not reducing the uncertainty. How do we perhaps create an analogous thing to what the Bayesians do with their maximum a posteriori point, the point that maximizes the posterior? Well, we're gonna define a MUD point, a maximal updated density point. It's gonna be the point that maximizes the updated distribution. And we're going to use this as a parameter estimate. And we're motivated to somehow create a framework that as you incorporate more measurements, that updated distribution becomes more peaked around the true value. So let's create a unifying framework so we can rely on some of the theory that the Bayesian literature provides with linear maps and Gaussian distributions for the roles of the observed, which the initial and uh, predicted covariance is gonna be linear as a result. Uh, predicted is gonna be Gaussian as a result of the linear map the initial covariance is linear, predicted variance is going to be linear. Uh, it's going to be Gaussian, I'm sorry. Uh, so that's given by equation 3.2. So we're going to have observed and likelihood again matching. They're going to be defined by normal distribution centered at y. The initial and prior are going to match. They're going to be centered at lambda naught. And we're going to show you an example that really uh, highlights the differences between them. First, the two solutions side by side is going to be the posterior and the update. Um, they look similar, but again, in one you have a constant denominator and the other you do not. As a result, we have, again, Gaussian distributions as our solutions for both the posterior and the update. And consequently, both solutions can be written as uh, exponential, because that's what Gaussian distributions are. They're going to be exponentials that are proportional to the t of lambda and j of lambda in this table. So our solutions are going to look like the uh, so our, our map and mud estimates are going to be like the minimums of t and lambda and j of lambda. And so we are solving two different regularization problems. And so this is really demonstrating that, again, we have two different objectives, basically. The Bayesian objective is to minimize the Tikhonov regularization. You're penalizing something on the parameter space. Data consistent also penalizes something on the parameter space, but subtracts off the impact of penalization on this data space. If your predictions match your data, that thing is going to be low your initial mean matches your predictions. It's going to be quite low. So as a consequence, like why is that term there? Well, it's because we have a non-constant denominator. 
non-constant denominator means we have this function that carries over, whereas the posterior has a constant denominator, it can just get swallowed up and it's not gonna impact what the impact what the map solution will actually be. So in practice, it's never actually computed because it's not important enough when you're using things like Monte Carlo, or Markov chain Monte Carlo, where you care about ratios of density. So the denominators are always gonna cancel out. We have functions, so we can't do that. So we're gonna have this term stick around. Making this more clear, we're gonna go through an example that highlights uh, the difference between the map and the mud solution. So here we have a linear map mapping two dimensions in the parameter space to one dimension in the output space. So we have a rank deficient problem. Why is this important? It means there are infinitely many solutions to the inverse problem. There's infinitely many answers that can explain the data that we observed, which is defined here on the bottom. It's observed mean at one with an observed covariance of a quarter. We're going to take this initial mean to be at a quarter and we're going to make this initial covariance have this sort of off diagonal components so that there's some bias and some directions. So attention to the left here. We have the same plot in the top and bottom. Uh, this is the data mismatch. The solution contour is in red. Anything along this red line constitutes an equally good solution that matches the data, right? Any point. So among this line, how are we going to choose a unique answer? This is the thing we're trying to address and show the difference between the two approaches is then what point is going to be selected. Well, in the top, we have the t can off, and on the bottom, we have our data, our modified data consistent regularization. So the regularization in the middle is just the initial, uh, initial uh, or prior. Then on the bottom, we have this modified regularization because we've subtracted off this component involving the predicted covariance. And so as a result, we unregularize in some directions. So consequently, since we're applying different regularizations, we're going to get different solutions. The mud solution on the bottom corner is always going to lie on the solution contour. It, by design, is meant to. Uh, just like least squares. Least square says, among the solution contour, pick the value with the smallest norm, right? So we're going to give you the same accuracy as least squares, but we're allowing you to point it in some direction according to your initial beliefs. However, we're going to ignore selectively your initial beliefs in directions where they do not inform us. This is the big distinction. The map point does not do this. The initial mean gets updated to become the mud point. So there's this on the bottom left, bottom right plot, you see this initial mean in black gets sent with this line that's drawn to the mud. Somewhere along this line is where the map point is going to lie because your initial beliefs are allowed to pull your conclusions away from the solution contour. If you have strong initial beliefs, you can move the map point off of the solution contour as is being done here. Why is that being done here? Well, the regularization, attention to the middle top plot, is pointing sort of par almost parallel to the solution contour. So you're biasing your beliefs in the wrong direction. We are managing to ignore them with our modified regularization. The map point by design isn't trying to, it wants to incorporate your prior beliefs. So as a result, the Bayesian posterior and the updated density, both Gaussian, are given by different covariances and different means. So they're going to have different solutions. Now let's study sort of formally what those look like analytically. So posterior covariance is given by uh, equation 3.3. Woodbury's identity can be applied to this to repose the posterior covariance as a rank decorrection of the initial. Everything on the left-hand side of the subtraction, I'm sorry, the right-hand side of the subtraction in 3.4 is just some matrix. And so what this uh, rank D, so it looks like a rank D correction of the initial. This term involving an inverse in equation 3.4 is invertible because both the predicted and the variance are observed are uh, uh, symmetric positive definite. So we can rewrite the analytical expression uh, as 3.5. So this is uh, how you go from initial mean to a map point and you have the posterior. So now uh, the posterior covariance. So now you have two things you need to define the updated density because it's a linear case. Let's try to do the same thing for the mud problem. Well, the modified regularization, it has two norms involved, not one. And so we have to rewrite it in terms of a single shared space, which is what R is allowing us to do here in 3.6. We're allowed to rewrite J in terms of just the sum of two. In this way, we are basically posing our problem as a modified, sort of a modified initial density where R is now taking that same role. 
So we can use the analytical expression for the, up, for the posterior covariance to then write the updated covariance in terms of R in place of the initial. However, we don't necessarily have the invertibility of that term on the right in 3.8. So we cannot apply Woodbury's identity. We have to do a bunch of linear algebra in order to get there. So do a bunch of linear algebra, eventually you get to this nasty term 3.9, where we also pose a rank D update to the initial. It's a different rank D update to the initial covariance. Now, in this rank D update, we have this difference between the predicted and the observed. Uh, that is one of the notable, notable distinctions. Uh, all of that nastiness in 3.9 actually cancels out wonderfully once we substitute it into 3.5 and gets you equation 3.10 bunch of terms disappear, and you have just this updated covariance. Uh, sorry, to go from 3.10 to 3.11, a lot of terms disappear, and you just get the expression on the bottom. So this equation 3.11 is what we were using in the previous slides to get these analytical mud and map points. So that then lets us pose this theorem. Uh, if we have these linear Gaussian assumptions, uh, we have ability, uh, we have a predictability assumption that needs to be satisfied, but if it's satisfied, uh, which we'll get to in a second, it just basically says do not divide by zero. Uh, there exists a unique mud point. It maps forward to the observed mean. And if we have a matching between data space dimension and parameter space dimension, the mud point is actually just given by the inverse of A. Um, otherwise, it's given by equation 3.11, and the covariance was given on that previous slide. So that divide by zero predictability assumption, it's formally stated as the predicted is a dominating measure for the observed. Our solution had a con non-constant term in the denominator, and so we need to make sure that sometimes we don't accidentally divide by zero. That is what this predictability assumption is basically uh, just formally stating. Now, in this linear case, we have no nice things we can do because we can just state this in terms of the eigenvalues of the predicted covariance and the observed covariance. Um, the minimum eigenvalue of the predicted covariance will have to be larger than the maximum eigenvalue of the observed covariance. This basically allows you to ensure that your prediction is sort of sufficiently wide in all directions to cover anything you're trying to predict with the observed, trying to pull back. So let's pose a, we're going to pose an example with a linear map that's randomly generated with Gaussian entries. Uh, we're going to uh, pose an initial covariance, which is diagonal and also randomly uh, drawn from a uniform distribution over 0.5 to 1. So we have this diagonal covariance without terms that are too ill-conditioned. But we're going to scale the initial covariance by a proportion to represent varying confidence in our initial beliefs. We're then going to also play around with the dimension of that map A or its rank. That's the left versus the right. These look super, super similar. And they are really similar because rank and dimension both correspond to the same idea, which is the amount of unique information present in the map. Well, since we're using random initial covariances here and we have these ill-defined maps, well, we have no uh, reasonable expectation that we can recover the truth. And we are not going to. We're going to resolve some directions of the truth, but others will remain unresolved until we have all of the dimensions incorporated. So along the way, if your initial covariance is providing direction in the right information, in the right, sorry, information in the right directions, well, your conclusions can actually get more accurate than least squares, because least squares is just trying to pick the smallest solution along the contour, not necessarily the truth. Uh, we're hiding, we're unable to resolve the truth here. So this is giving us the ability to find it. Now, black line here is the mud and the reds are the map. Notice that the map solution has six different lines that you can see sort of sweeping across here. The six lines for the mud all stack on top of each other. They are invariant to alpha. No matter how strong your initial beliefs are, our accuracy for the mud solution is not going to be impacted. We're going to retain the predictive precision of least squares while giving you the flexibility of incorporating prior beliefs like the Bayesian posteriors. Now, giving you the best of both worlds in some sense, because if you get lucky with your initial beliefs, you can actually gain more accuracy. But if your initial beliefs are wrong, not going to impact us. So that's all nice and well, but linear cases, you haven't really gone into what you're doing here with practical data, not so interesting. So let's get into the weeds. You have just data coming at you. How do you take this data and turn it into something where we can leverage all that theory we just gave you? 
right? We've motivated the MUD solution has some desirable properties. How do we then just turn an arbitrary collection of data into something where we can leverage that? Well, we're going to introduce some notation to, to record the you know, measurement devices generating the i uh, measurement from the jth uh, measurement device. Uh, each one's going to be perturbed. So this is sort of lining up with the Bayesian in, uh, inverse problem now. We're sort of making the same assumption that one true value, lambda dagger, it can explain all the data. And so we're going to construct a d-dimensional vector-valued map from data obtained on the measurement devices. And we're going to do this by component-wise defining this weighted mean error map, Q. 3.13 looks a lot like a central limit theorem, by design, what we're doing is taking like a z-score of each measurement and dividing by the sample average of the total number of measurements for that device. Now, as a result, what we're doing is basically transforming each raw datum into something that looks like a draw from a normal, a unit normal. So we're asking a question now about the distribution of residuals. It should look like a random draw from this normal distribution. So that's why I'm motivated to pull back this observed distribution, which is uh, standard normal in, in D dimensions. Let that sink in. We are now posing a question about parameter identification as a problem of pulling back a distribution in some sense on the residuals of that data and the mismatch. The predicted covariance is given by the variance associated with using that component, the jth component. That's given by equation 314 here. Uh, all the matrix multiplication and division going on here is basically just some value. Uh, N sub J in front then shows us that the predicted variance is going to grow linearly with the number of terms collected. So as you collect more data, the predicted variance grows. So what were the Bayesians doing? As more data got incorporated, their likelihood function got more peaked. Our observed is going to stay constant. Our numerator is going to stay the same. What's changing now is our denominator is going to grow. So the relative impact is that you're getting more precision because you're stretching out the data space and trying to predict something that still takes up the same amount of space. Consequence of this is that there exists a minimum number of measurements required uh, so that we can satisfy the predictability assumption because you can always figure out how large n has to be to make sure that the denominator is sufficiently large. So the eigenvalue spectrum, uh, the spectrum of the predicted covariance can dominate the observed. This is great. This is a nice <laughs> theoretical result. It tells us we have a definite way when we use this quantity of interest map, this WME map, to make sure we are solving the stochastic inverse problem and that the MUD solution we get will actually map to this uh, targeted observed mean, which was zero. So let's violate some assumptions and see what happens. Uh, we're now not going to assume uh, normal densities on the prior, on the initial density. We're not going to be comparing to Bayesians anymore. We're just going to show you our approach, our way of posing this problem allows us to incorporate an arbitrary number of measurements for systems that are not linear, not necessarily satisfying the assumptions, and that using this weighted mean error map will allow us to do parameter identification. So here we're going to pose a parameter identification, which is trying to determine the, in, the decay rate of a um, exponential decay model. So we have an initial condition of 0.75, and we know and we know that things are going down, but we don't know what rate. We're going to take measurements from time one to time three at 100 times a second. The true value here is one half the rate, and the point here is that as you collect more measurements, you get more uh, more you get convergence in expectation and in variance. Um, this is exactly what we want to see. We're reducing epistemic uncertainty as more measurements are being collected. This is great. So consequently perhaps a little less interesting, is that uh, as you collect more data going from top to bottom, we go from 20 to 200 measurements. Our uh, initial beliefs, our guesses, which are shown in gray here very faintly, get resolved down to the red, which are these 20 mud solutions for different realizations of noise, that noise being bounded by the dotted lines, showing you one example realization in these photos. But we want to resolve that true signal in black. And when you collect more data, the red solutions all become more similar and they lie directly on top of the black. It's exactly what we want to see. More data, better predictions. Another problem, a uh, Poisson problem. We are now going to do parameter identification in a slightly more interesting way. Instead of a scalar that we're trying to estimate the true value of, we're going to try to estimate a function, g. 
This is the uncertain boundary condition on the left side of this square unit, uh, square unit domain. Um, gammas are going to represent the top, bottom, left, and right boundaries. And on the top and bottom, we have Dirichlet boundary conditions, so there's zero. So we actually know the value of g at two places, the zero. Uh, the forcing function is given in the bottom here. It's this sort of exponential function centered in the middle. g, again, is what we're trying to solve for. It's a function, though. So how are we going to, and what function? It's this seventh order polynomial. We scale it so that it has a minimum value that's at negative 3. Um, it takes a minimum of negative 3. And uh, we define these parameters for the mesh. We take our measurements on the interior. What are we trying to do with these sensors, these 100 sensors, is we're trying to recover the structure of G. We're going to repeat this 20 times, and we're going to only allow ourselves 1,000 samples from an initial. OK, well, what initial? How are we going to estimate G? We need some way to parameterize this function. Okay, I'm not going to assume knowledge that it's a seventh order polynomial. I, I'm not going to pretend like I know that. I'm not going to impose a polynomial basis to try to interpolate it. I'm going to just estimate the value of g, which is given in black here. Notice again, minimum at negative 3. I'm just going to estimate the value at two interior points. We already know the value at 0 and 1. So at x2 equals 1 third and 2 thirds, just equally spaced points in the interior, I'm going to place two knots. And my goal is to estimate the value of g at these two knots such that I, to the best of my ability, match the noisy predictions that I uh, get off the response surface. So the initial samples are going to be these purple curves here. A lot of them look like pretty wacky functions. They're all these piecewise linear interpolations between uh, two knot points. So none of them really look anything like g. Um, but it's a start. It's just trying to understand, at least generally, what is the behavior of the system at these two values. Now, again, attention to this black curve. It's taking a minimum at negative uh, 2 sevenths. On the left here, that minimum corresponds to this blue region on the left. That's going to correspond to the smallest value. The yellow is going to correspond to basically 0. That's the highest values. We perturb the entire response surface with noise just to give you a sense of how much noise we uh, hit the system with. It's proportional to a decimal place of accuracy in 99% of the measurements. All Gaussian errors are going to be bounded that way. That's where that sigma up top comes from. Uh, tau is saying a decimal place of accuracy. Uh, and we're going to place the 100 sensors in the interior, and we're going to try to estimate the value of those two white triangle points on the left. So we motivated now a two-dimensional problem, two parameters to estimate. So we have every motivation to pick a two-dimensional map. And so one way of constructing such a two-dimensional map would be to split the top and bottom into two components of the map. Every, uh, every sensor value reading from the top half will get collapsed into the first component of the quantity of interest map. And every component, every measurement from the bottom will get collapsed in the second. We are now going to compare this vector valued quantity of interest map to a scalar valued map, which we generate just by collapsing all 100 measurements into a single quantity of interest. And we're going to show how this dimension, this lack of an extra dimension, is actually going to hurt our ability to estimate the true parameter. So on the left, we have our updated density for the scalar valued solution. And on the right, we have our vector valued. We solve this problem for 20 realizations of noise and show you 20 such map and mud, uh, sorry, mud points uh, on the bottom. So one specific density is shown on the top, but mud samples from 20 different densities are shown on the bottom. Notice the scalar value solution is unable to resolve all the directions of uncertainty that the vector is. It has this sort of equivalence class structure. And as a result, mud parameters are going to fly all over the place there. And so the minimum is not going to be necessarily at the right spot. The vector valued solution, by closing the dimension gap between input and output space, resolves more directions of uncertainty. And as a result, gets you far, far more accurate predictions. These lines now look a lot more like the interpolant. But Interpolant isn't necessarily even the best estimate. The thing that actually is the closest sample we took that minimized the like, noiseless um, sensors is going to be given in this red dashed line. That's really sort of the best predictive precision we could hope for. We actually seem to explore really well both the interpolant and the closest solution in the output space, which, again, we have no way of knowing. We're just doing it for this example. The scalar one on the left, though, doesn't. It's not exploring the right regions. It's it, In fact, it cannot make up its mind about where the minimum actually is and what it should be. So we have every motivation to do a vector valued map. But how we construct this vector valued map matters. We have to pay attention to the geometry we are imposing by 
breaking up our measurements into different components. But what we're going to do here is going to take two different approaches to splicing up the data. On the left, we have what we did before, this horizontal split. On the right, we have this vertical split. Those are going to be the two new components. We take the first 20, 60, and 100 of these measurements and the associated two-dimensional maps and plot the updated densities as scatter plots to show that there is high correlation with the vertical band QI and much less so with the horizontal band quantity of interest. Moreover, as you incorporate more measurements, we're seeing this predictability thing come into play here. We're getting more measurements, so wider variances. But the vertical band QI is just getting skinnier, so its diameter is also increasing, but it's so heavily correlated that it basically looks one-dimensional. And so it's going to perform basically as bad as one dimension. So you're not just trying to construct a vector valued map that matches the dimension of the input space, but you have to respect the geometry of what you're doing. This property called skewness, which quantifies how square these pictures are basically, in some sense, it's just the intuition. So how rectangular the predicted distribution is, is going, is, sorry, yeah, how rectangular are sets mapped between them. So the predicted distribution is one such set. The sets will be is going to tell you how much precision. So perfectly orthogonal directions, a nice unit square, you have unique information in every direction, you have minimal skewness, you have total identifiability. The opposite of that is high correlation, high, uh, very thin angles between respective directions. That's what we're seeing in the vertical band QI. And so consequently, the vertical band solutions shown on the right are going to look a lot like the solutions on the left. They definitely reduce variance and they are absolutely improving the prediction, right? A bunch more of the possible solutions are now focusing in on the closest in the output space, but we are still not able to resolve which of the two not points is the true minimum. The vector value solution made no such, uh, no such errors, right? It never put a minimum in the wrong spot when we did the horizontal split. The vector valued solution with the vertical split does occasionally, for at least five of these solutions, put the knot in the wrong place. Still a lot better than the 1D, but again, practically as bad as the 1D. If you're just trying to make predictions, you can't rely on them necessarily. So let's take this idea of geometric distinctness of information to uh, the next, next level and say we have a bunch of directions uh, available here, we're going to have a rotation map of 10 equispace rotations. And we're going to have this map basically in 10 directions in two dimensions. And we're instead of solving a vector value problem where we have to figure out which two dimensional quantity of interest to, to build, uh, we're just going to solve a sequence of one dimensional problems. This is an interesting extension of the work because remember how earlier I said we use density estimation to compute the prediction, uh, predicted density. Well, as dimension grows, that prediction becomes harder and harder to do. So if you have a very low model evaluation budget, you have every incentive to pose a smaller dimensional problem. Here, we're going to pose one dimensional problem. So we understand the convergence rate quite well and solve a sequence of these problems. So what we're doing is trading off accuracy in respect of directions, of the map. We're saying first on the left here, we're going to say project. We're going to use the analytical mud expression to do these projections. We're just going to project to that first dimensional component. Then we're going to go to the next and the next. And what this results in is this, by the time you've used all the data, you've used 10 directions here, but you haven't moved very far away or very close to the truth. You haven't moved far away from your initial prediction, your mean, the blue point, towards the truth, the red. Take this three steps, three epochs further, so 30 total iterations now, and you're still not hitting the red target. Let's say you just selected two directions at random. Well, if the angle between them is small, like we have with nine and 10 uh, on the left, we get 10 iterations gets you closer, but still kind of meandering away uh, slower towards the solution. But if the directions have larger angles, again, more, uh, less skewness, like directions three and six on the right, we can actually in 10 steps, look at that, we're hitting the target now. So again, this, this iterative uh, approach of going on to each component successively, yeah, you have to solve this more sequ a sequence of more problems, but they're lower dimensional problems, so you scale your computational effort just linearly with the number of problems you solve. And you can converge towards truth. It's going to be impacted by the angle between the directions you choose. 
So if you did some work and discovered what the most orthogonal directions were, like you would with like seven and two or nine and four on the left, just a couple steps gets you to the truth. In fact, if they're perfectly orthogonal, you'll get there in exactly n steps where n is the dimension. So here they're not perfectly orthogonal. They're a little bit off, but in just two steps, they're already closer than the solution that was just going uh, in order that the maps were defined by respective angle. If you don't want to put the work in to discover the angles between these components, so because you're going to need some gradient information for nonlinear map that might be prohibitively expensive. Let's say you're just going to take an approach that's more ad hoc. Well, we showed that if you just project to random directions, or shuffle up the ordering of the components and just go at random, it actually works pretty well too. Here's an example on the right where we're moving towards the uh, truth in a matter of 10 steps only. And again, we just select a random. We had no grade information to take. It's again, derivative free optimization in some sense. So averaging this out, we're going to now generate different initial means each time and uh, shuffle up the components differently. And we have a couple different ways of doing this. The ordered one that we showed first, we already expect it to be bad. And lo and behold, it's bad. It's on the right, on the top and right there. Shuffled QI is so you're going to use the 10 uh, directions. You're going to shuffle them up. And then you're going to do 10 epochs of those 10 directions. So you're going to repeat that process 10 times. You've used all the data 10 times each. Uh, and again, you get much better convergence in this black line. Even better, though, is if you still use all directions 10 times over all, so 10 times 10. If you just stack the components first and then shuffle it up, so you basically have one epoch of a 100-dimensional map where it's 10 directions repeated 10 times, that actually gets you even better convergence. And if you just don't restrict yourself to using all directions 10 times each and just choose directions at random each iteration, so in expectation you would eventually, uh, you get pretty similar results. That's what the random QI in the bottom is. Uh, so some interesting future work here is exploring how well this works in other approaches. Um, what else is this sensitive to? Uh, and extending it to nonlinear maps and also maps where there are uh, problems where there's error. Here, all the components intersected at a point. That's not going to happen. Your contours are actually going to be estimated contours. So you're going to actually define a convex set. And as you collect more components and more data, that size of that convex set should go down. So there's lots of interesting results uh, that we can probably come up with just exploring the optimization of how long it takes to get to that convex set instead of a single point estimate. So it's the end of my talk. Uh, all of the work here is very, very super duper duper reproducible. Uh, it's all in GitHub. It is uh, well validated for reproducibility, uh, publicly available libraries. You can pip install MUD and get a bunch of the analytical expressions here as Python functions. And all the LaTeX is also up online for total reproducibility as well. So. Thank you for your time and uh, appreciate you being here. All my friends, family, uh, super grateful. Mentors, thank you so much. That's the end of my talk. Do we just do waving? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. That was, that was a great talk. So um, we want to open it up to questions from the audience uh, and and then after uh, a while of those questions, we will uh, dismiss everybody, and then and then the committee will will remain with Michael to ask further questions. I can. I have a question. If you go back to the point in the presentation where you said, "Now let's look at what if we just have a data stream," because that they're going kind of fast and. I'd yeah, like to know, that, what would you ask from, if, if, if someone comes to you with a problem, what do they need to give you besides the data? Do model. they have to specify a, to a model also? Although if they give me, um, technically speaking, if you just give me, if you did a bunch of evaluations already and just came with me, came at me with here's samples from my input, here's the corresponding data that they generate, and you don't give me access to the model, I can still attempt to find which of the samples you took was the best estimate for the data you collected, absolutely. So technically, I don't need to interrogate the model if you've interrogated it for me. OK, so you're saying that if, if they have measurements, what if they don't even have a model? They just have it's data. It's just raw data? Yeah, and they just have a question about what, you know, what do these data say about you know, some other data that we think are related? 
Um, I mean, this is this is about parameter identification for a model, right? right? If you don't have a model, I don't necessarily know what you're asking me to do. I would do model exploration at that point. Right. Okay. And um, when you have a model, how do you tune it, basically? Right. And then one of the sort of minor technical thing when you introduce the regularization functions uh, t and j, and j is sort of subtracting this term from t. Um, is it sort of built in that uh, that subtraction can't make j go negative? That is what the predictability assumption is basically going to ensure. That you okay. don't divide by zero because that would be the same corresponding thing. Right. Okay. Very good. Well, that, Michael, I enjoyed it a lot. I'm glad uh, we really got to hear your presentation, and I think it's got a lot of uh, good applications. Yeah, I'm I think looking so. forward to see the applications. Me, I'm excited to do them. <laughs> Any other questions? I wish I could see everyone at once, but I can't while I'm screen sharing. Yeah. So if if uh, I mean just. We, we have a lot of people here. If anyone wants to, I mean, has a question and they're, they're shy about butting in, you can uh, post a question in the chat room for Zoom. Uh, and I will keep an eye on that so, so we can kind of order that. Or you can just jump right in. It was a perfect talk. There's no question. <laughs> Yeah, I think this figure really says a lot here. Like just we're solving different problems with different objectives. It works for parameter identification. It's great when you have a lack of resolved directions, maybe equivalence classes that you want to do parameter estimation from. Maybe while you have this figure up, Michael, I can just ask uh, a question I have, which is sort of at what point, or, or maybe at what point do you have the conversation about, wow, my data is really lousy, maybe so much so that I don't want to do DCI. Yeah, if you have very strong initial beliefs and you don't trust the data you collected, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is what you want to do because this is actually very intentionally trying to match the residuals in the observations. And you can assume large variance for your noise and match that, you certainly can. Um, but if you want your initial assumptions to be incorporated more heavily, then yeah, this is not what this is for. Yeah, the philosophical distinction is different. We want to match the observed distribution. Bayesians want to update initial beliefs with new information. It's just a different question. Any other questions? Okay, then, um, well, let's thank Michael one more time and then uh, yeah, wave hands, applause, applause. And then if uh, you can ask the committee and Michael to stay in the room and everyone else.